I said we'll be in the book of Acts 21, and we'll actually get to sort of finish by partaking in communion together. I would recommend, just as a practical note before we get into the Word and more serious, there, for, for those who are doing this here or at home, there's a little plastic top where you open up the bread. I would suggest just getting that started. Otherwise, in the midst of trying to, in the moment, it can be pretty frustrating, as I have found after the last couple of times. So just a bit of practical wisdom there so that you can be ready for that. Uh, as a background, you guys have been flocking with us, most of you, for a long time through this book of the Bible. We have seen Paul kind of take uh, central stage as, on the apostolic front, although who would he put forward as central? Anyway, there we go. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, someone. Oh, whew. okay. We at least got that squared away. Jesus is central. Last chapter, we just actually saw Paul has now decided to embark on a journey to Jerusalem. Now, this chapter, we're going to see his arrival and the turbulence that ensues. And it's kind of fascinating. Right here in the Belgic Confession, we talked about how we've got a mark of true Christian is fleeing sin, pursuing righteousness. Nothing is ever coincidence. That, That phrase is key as we even look at Christians this week in this chapter who run pell mell in the opposite direction. And it's, it's going to be a little heavy, maybe as Ben alluded to without even realizing it, a little more of a corrective call this week than an encouraging call. I think as Paul gives his testimony next week, we get to see a, an encouragement and excitement as he shares his testimony. Here we have a passage that's potentially a little more troubling. But before we get there, uh, this last week has been a heavy one, right? 2020 continues to not disappoint in that regard. If you were breathing and had a connection to media last week, you probably heard of the decision made in the Ronna Taylor case, and that is not for debate today. We should continue praying for our nation. We should pray for that community in Kentucky. We should pray for all the families involved intimately and emotionally. In fact, I determined not to have any opinion whatsoever until I listened to the nearly full hour of address and Q&A by the Kentucky Attorney General, Daniel Cameron, the first black Attorney General in the history of the state, and a voice that then, circumstances being what they are, seemed worth listening to in full. A black man with the difficult job of striving for impartiality, and the job of only delivering every fact to others who would make decisions. A thankless job in many ways. From my admittedly limited perspective, he seems a man of earnestness and integrity as well as a professing brother in Christ and the church we just talked about. But to be clear, this is not a sermon about racial issues. The reason I bring it up is because something said in his hour-long address, something that he said is not limited to issues of race, or police, or this situation, or America, or 2020, but rather a couple of timeless ideas that no matter where we're at in our hearts and minds on what's going on, as Christians we should believe that these words are applicable in every situation, including the chapter in Acts, which we're about to read today. It's always strange to me, our God is a God of providence. We don't, we don't plan these chapters to coincide with world events, but he often provides something in the current culture that seems to dovetail quite nicely. In his address to the Attorney General of Kentucky, he said, every person has an idea of what they think justice is. Despite passions, opinions, justice must be done. It's not often easy. It does not fit the mold of public opinion, and it does not conform to shifting standards. It answers only to the facts and the law. If we simply act on emotion or outrage, there's no justice. Mob justice isn't justice. Justice sought by violence isn't justice. It becomes revenge. And justice isn't the quest for revenge. It's the quest for truth and the use of that truth as we fairly apply laws. And then he says the main thing I want us to focus on. We'll put it on the screen. Again, not just connected to a present application. Plus yourself back and think timeless. Our reaction to the truth is the society we want to be. 
Do we really want the truth? Or do we want a truth that fits our narrative? Do we want the facts? Are we content to blindly accept our own version of events? We as a community must make this decision. Now we're, we're going to see people do some egregious things in the name of outrage and justice today. We're going to see Christians do some egregious things in the name of outrage and justice. Thank God we also get to see at the beginning of the chapter some loving, caring hearts to offset that. But lastly, we have a call to something timeless to focus on as we set our course. I think that's a perfect passage and a perfect part of the passage to dwell on as we move we're so rapidly toward an election, so rapidly through this you know, easy year of no contention. So I will pray, and let's dig into Acts chapter 21 in its fullness. Father, we thank You that we can learn from Your Word. Sometimes we can read a passage and it can hit us where we live in a dramatic way. Sometimes that same passage in its fullness can hit a different circumstance and teach us as we look at both the descriptions of your church and your followers, as we may not see prescriptions exactly for our conduct, but we see folly and we see wisdom, may we take those descriptions and apply them. And by your fullness of your entire word, reflect on the prescription for our lives in your name. Amen. And when we had parted from them, you guys remember as we begin, we indicates that Luke is now part of the party once again as the writer of the book. It says, and when we'd parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria, landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemy, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea. We entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound, it on, and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles." When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. And Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in, in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They're all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. To forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men, purify yourself along with them, and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what's been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the men 
And the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone, everywhere, against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another, and he could not learn the facts because of the uproar. He ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, Away with him! You know what? We're, we're going to save the rest of it for next week. We'll just stop right there. The next goes pretty well with the next chapter. And actually breaks up the verses a little more too. Away with him. I, I, I want to ask you guys as a pastor, not to automatically have your brain turned on to, oh, those other people this morning. I really need us to think about ourselves this morning because I, I want you to dare to consider honestly and earnestly that you're probably doing it wrong. I mean, don't raise your hand, but raise your hand if you've achieved full sanctification. Okay, there you go. I want us to challenge ourselves that we need to change. That shouldn't be hard. Let's start with something a little more detached from ourselves to warm up, though. Let, let's judge Paul a little bit, shall we? Because that's the first bit some people, some commentators actually wrestle with in this chapter. We'll, we'll start easy. Let's do the warm up. Should Paul stay or should he go? Right? Some have seen what appears to be a discrepancy in Scripture here by some readers. They're like, wait, I, I'm not sure what's happening here. Right there early as they're going from place to place. It says, having sought out the disciples, they stayed there for seven days. And through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. So was Paul supposed to go to Jerusalem or not? Because last chapter he said he was constrained by the Holy Spirit to go. And now if I read this flatly in, in English translation, I'm kind of like, wait, is, is the Spirit telling these people to tell him not to go? But then telling him to go? That sounds like a spirit of confusion, not the Holy Spirit. In fact, some commentators actually disagree on this. I found some commentators that actually want to say that Paul makes a mistake here, that he's not listening to the Spirit. And in fact, that if he, had just, if he hadn't gone, then all the things that happened and lead up to his imprisonment and all the bad things didn't have to happen. God warned him. That, that works great from a commentator perspective. That works great for a prosperity gospel, right? Hey, if you listen to God, you don't ever have to go through hardship. Paul just was stubborn and didn't listen and pushed forward. That's not really the best reading of the fullness of the book of the Bible or, or of Scripture, to be honest. And that's maybe our first point, that just to remind, something that's challenging to us, sometimes warnings of hardship may not be telling us to back off. Like last week, we even Paul, talk, Paul talked about how he, he, I do not shrink from proclaiming the full gospel. Sometimes I know things are going to get me in hot water, but that, I'm called forward to that. Sometimes warnings of hardship aren't calling, war, telling us not to go. They're calling us onward, but being honest about what's coming. Right? I mean, we see Jesus. Jesus knew what was going to await him. Every step of the way, he keeps telling his disciples. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's just like, if this cup, but, like he, he knows that he still is going to need to drink from that cup, even if in his flesh he expresses that he would rather not. And so here we have something very similar happening to Paul. It, without doing a lot, a lot of fancy Greek work for you, as one commentary says, did the Holy Spirit speaking through the Tyrian Christians 
tell Paul and his companions not to go to Jerusalem? It was the Spirit who compelled Paul to go in the first place, according to chapter 19 and 20. So what we have here is a translation issue where it could feel like what it's saying is that the Spirit is causing them to tell him not to go. The Spirit is speaking to them. Sometimes things are not causal, they're corollary, if you, get the, if you understand the gist of that. Yes, the Spirit's telling these people, just like Paul knows, Paul's going to face hardships and trial. The Spirit's clearly, obviously, communicating to the whole group, this is gonna, there's going to be some bad stuff that goes on. And so naturally then, as concerned Christian friends, are like, no, 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 maybe you don't have to go. Don't go. No, that, that's going to be bad. But we all do this, right? I mean, that's kind of the second point, right? We all hope for our fellows to be spared from hardship. As a pastor, I don't, I don't want... I don't want folks to go through the heavy time. I don't want them to face the trial. I don't want them to face something that's going to be such an extreme and devastating test and, and be tears and trials. But sometimes that is God's course. So Paul, Paul hears their heart. And he's like, no, I, I, I hear your heart. And yeah, the Spirit's told you, I, Spirit, just like has told me, bad things are going to happen, but I have to go. I have to go. Like, don't dissuade me. This is not, and ultimately, they all land in that same place, right? They all say, God's will be done. God's will be done. As Christians who care about others, like, I, these Christians are not at fault for doing something wrong. Like, we all cry out like that. We care about others. How should this frame our hearts and actions? We should pray for sunshine. For, I pray for sunshine on the lives of all my friends that I love in Christ, and, and even those that don't know Christ. But I also accept the rain. Right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So Paul is going to go. Paul's going to go. The Spirit's making it clear to everybody what's gonna, what it's going to be like, but he needs to. And so then we, we begin with the first leg of this arduous trial that Paul goes through. So some, I mean, we, let's, let's talk about Paul's close shave, right? This is the first step when he shows up. He shows up, there's people who are glad to meet him, very encouraging, but they also know that there's a whole other crowd there, right? Like, hey, hey, man, there's some people. There are people who, now they're described as, there are many thousands among the Jews that have believed. So like they've said, Jesus is the Messiah. But they're also zealous for the law. And they've heard these things about you. And we'll get to, it just to, we'll get to exactly what they heard in just a minute. But they define the problem. It's like, Paul, there's these very law-abiding Jews They've heard that you are telling everybody to just forget all that, and they're mad, they're angry, we don't know what's going to happen, so here's what you should do. You should go do something that's very law-abiding. In fact, don't just do it yourself, pay for four other guys, so that we're like, oh, you support that others should follow the law, and you're doing it with them. So what, that his friends suggest the solution to the problem. Now, here, as one commentator talked about that too. He says, it, now here's what Paul had actually said. It's likely true that some of Paul's Jewish converts in his missionary journeys were, jo when joining communities that were largely made up of Gentiles, they had, prob they had probably ceased to be Torah observant. I mean, we see teachings that Paul has in Galatians 4, 9, 5, 6, Romans 2. And doubtless, Paul had not insisted that they had to be Torah observant, especially since he himself on some occasions would be a Gentile to the Gentiles, and a Jew to the Jews. But we see no evidence that Paul went around actively trying to persuade Jewish Christians to be non-observant. We, we don't see that. In Paul's mind, you could observe it or not so long as you didn't think it was salvific, as long as you didn't attach it to salvation. Law observance, he could, it, it's a good means for a Jew to express your walk with God as long as you don't think of it as a means of salvation. And so they asked Paul to undertake this action that would make clear that he supported those who were Torah observant and that he himself was even willing to keep the law. And so what do we see Paul do? Well, on one hand, the accusation against him isn't true. It's distorted. We'll talk about that in a second. And the unfiltered truth he has been teaching is, is totally true. So Paul here has every right to say no. He could put his foot down. I don't have to. I've done nothing wrong. I don't have to do some token gesture. So like a good Christian pounding the table about his liberty, he, oh no, he doesn't. He just, he does it. He does it. He goes and he does it. 
He doesn't need to, but he does to make peace. And this is something I think American Christians really have to think about and wrestle with too. Our liberty, here's the challenge, here's the the converse thinking. Our liberty includes that we're not only freed from doing something, we're also free to do it. Like the liberty rolls both ways. Like I I don't have to do these things to be saved, I'm saved by grace. In fact, I don't have to do that. I don't even have to do it to be a good Christian. So most of us are like, I'll show you. No, I have my liberty in Christ. How dare you? Bottom line, you you don't have to do a lot of things as a Christian. You have Christian liberty, but you also have liberty in Christ to do them. You're free to do them too. You're free to do them to make peace or keep peace. Right? That's why 1 Corinthians says all things are permissible, but we should be doing things that are what? Beneficial. 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says, he's the one, he's like, to the Jew I became a Jew, to the Gentile I became a Gentile. Romans 12, he says, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. I guess ask ask yourself this morning, how much time do we spend on the I don't got us? When it would only take a little effort to not make a scene and make for peace. To love your brother. Maybe even love your weaker brother. Oh my... My sweet, sweet Lord in heaven, this, this year has brought out the worst in some of us. The I don't got us and the you can't make me's. Like you're free. I'm free to restrain myself. I have the liberty to do what I don't want to do. That's the countercultural upside down message of the gospel sometimes, right? It's so much easier to be angry, angry at the other. But here, despite Paul's freedom, he decides to accommodate. Now, sadly, even his freedom to accommodate for the sake of peace doesn't work. Doesn't work this time. And here's where we get to the main issue of today. Because here we have, once again, we just, it's like we were just here. Like, remember back at Ephesus, we had this mob outrage. Now we got a whole other chapter. Guess what happens? People get stirred up. Mob outrage. The Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd. Men of Israel, Help! This guy's a danger. This is a man who's teaching everyone, everywhere. And, and against what? Against the people and the law and this place. And he even brought Greeks into the temple. Now, do something with me here. A little mental switch. I want you to try to disconnect all of this from a specific, the specific event we understand. Disconnect it from that for a minute. What's happening, happening here? Because I am gravely convicted that what we see them doing here, we have perfected in 2020. Better, faster, wider, and more destructive. At least, you could parse this out a couple different ways. I, I'm going to talk, like, let's look at three sins here. And let's actually ask ourselves about them. That's a heavy thing to consider. I'm not even just going to ask the question, are we guilty of three sins featured here? I'll be blunt. I, we, it last, this year, at, at all our elders' meetings, we've had conversations about what, we have conversations about what we see in culture and what we see in the church in America. And what we see in Refuge Church. And what we see in in everybody's social media feeds. What we hear in the conversations. And like on all levels, I'll be honest, including my own words. I could go back, I could, guess what? Great thing about Facebook and Twitter, you can go back and research yourself, right? We look back at all of that, from the broadest to the church in America, to Refuge, to everything, and just to be brutally honest, yeah, it kind of breaks our hearts. We've talked about it. We see several things here that I think we see in the crowd that we're all guilty of. I'll at least say I've been. I'll take the first step. Sin of inflation. They've been told about you that you teach all the Jews to forsake Moses. All the Jews. Is that true? What's the stir up claim later? This man is teaching everyone, everywhere. Really? Paul's omnipresent now? He's been through the whole world, really? Talked with every Jewish person? Oh, but it, that gets the people riled up, right? If I, do, if I just started something, oh, I've, I've heard he's told some people. It's like, oh, that's not going to get the mob going. No, everyone, everywhere. This, this happens at our home, right? This happens in arguments with a spouse. Or, or this first. First, we always see it in the teenager, right? Let's, let's blame those teenagers these days, right? They're always like, Mom, you always! Really? Always? Really? Like when she wasn't even here five minutes ago, she was doing it? Like, what? 
It's just ridiculous, right? And then we say, oh wait, I can't just blame the teens because how many times have mom and dad said it to each other in an argument? We're no better than our teenagers, right? Or I mean, a great one, right? You broke my trust in this, you broke my trust in this area. I don't know if I can ever trust you with anything anywhere anymore. Really? Like was was that person not? doing some things well, keeping some aspects of relationship or covenant? Or how about we just, how about just making something singular plural? Here's my favorite. I saw, it's like, you see it in the news, a, a political figure, celebrity, doesn't matter. They, it, it's claimed that one person, let's say one woman has a thing against a guy that he did something, and now we see something in everybody's social media feeds. Oh, well, it's obvious this person doesn't believe women. Wait, we have one woman. Now it's women? How come, how, how'd that get plural? It couldn't have been one ash issue of bad judgment. It couldn't have been regardless of gender. Now not only has the tweeter or the poster or the chatterer judged a person's motivation, but inflated how many times he's perpetrated the issue. One incident's become a pattern of behavior, unsubstantiated. One instance of unloving behavior, even if true, then becomes, oh, that's their life standard. I, I, now some of you are going to be like, oh, come on, James, they're just, they're just making a point. Yeah, an untrue and inflated point. Distorting truth is what Satan has been doing since the garden. It's like the first thing. Just a word here and there. Did God really say? Maybe no. It, it's, it's this way. Just a word here and there. Just make a singular plural. Truth bent just a little bit brought death to the whole universe. So, I mean, congratulations, we're in good company. That's sarcasm, by the way, just to clarify. Satan is not good company. How about the sin of addition? Because we just sort of blow something up. But then it's like they accuse, what do they accuse Paul of here? He's, he's against, he's not, just ha- he's not just picking apart a piece of the law. It's not just the law, he's against the people and the law and this place. Right? They just start adding things. Well, he isn't against the law technically either. He's saying its purpose and position aren't what the people think it is. So you could so they've inflated that, but then they start adding, oh, he's against you people. It's just, he must be against us. Well, he differs with us on the law, so he must hate us too. He differs with our opinion on this issue, so he must loathe us. And he loathes all people. Let's get him riled up that he hates, that he's a hater. Right? You just added to it, as if you can't disagree with someone sharply and still love them, or still work with them. Still trying to get over it. I, I want to read more. I, I just read some random factoid, which i got to verify, about that, that Scalia and Ginsburg were actually friends. Really? How'd that happen? Not just work together, actually maintained a friendship? I've seen this all over social media, too. We saw it a few years ago, right? Oh, some celebrity made it. They made such a crass joke about this sexually deviant thing. They made the crass joke. Obviously, they've, they've obviously then done it too. I mean, they, they, they joked about it, so obviously they've committed, the, they've committed the crime. They've committed the deed. Man, only somebody who's, who, who's done that would make that joke. Now, the joke could be disgusting and need a rebuke but I don't get to add other things to that person's sin list. Oh, this person's soft on terrorism. They must be a secret Muslim. Oh, they went to a protest. They must be a communist. Like, well, they're, in, they're inadvertently supporting some of those things. Well, then say that. Use your words, right? Don't, don't just add things to people like they add things to Paul. And then we see the sin, the biggest one of all, assumption. We all learned from mom and dad what happens when we assume, right? We have something about a donkey. But, right, here we go. He even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. And how do they know this? For they'd previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that, well, Paul must have brought him in. Oh, I saw this person with this person. So they must have done this terrible thing. Or maybe that person did a terrible thing, and I, oh, but I saw them with them, so they must be in cahoots. 
Right? Oh, I saw this person with Epstein, so that means... That means I can slander them, apparently. It's like, well, uh, even if they weren't in league with Epstein and some of all his depravity, they're still terrible people. Well, but you don't get to say the other thing then. I mean, this manifests in so many places. It could happen to me, right? Oh, James made a snide comment about someone. Why did he make a snide comment about that person? Well, who are they? Oh, this person is an Indian agnostic lesbian woman. Oh, that must mean he's racist. Oh, that, no, no, it means he's spiritually intolerant. Or no, it means he's homophobic. Or no, it means he hates, he hates women, he's a misogynist. Actually, no, she just said she didn't like any of the Star Wars movies except the one with Jar Jar Binks. By the way, that comment still isn't warranted, all humor aside. But. Or how about The Last Temptation of Christ? I remember this movie that came out years ago. It was about Jesus, and all these Christians were getting furious about these things it depicted in the third act, which in context actually made sense because they were the last temptation, which was a vision he had, which he summarily rejects on the cross. People were incensed about all these things that they heard that were depicted in the film in Act 3. I was like, it's ridiculous. What a ridiculous assumption. Now, the theology in Act 1 actually was pretty bad. Like why, Christians apparently weren't smart enough to pick apart the theology. They could just pick on some visual depictions that they assumed meant that they were mocking Jesus. That's just sad. We get all three of these, and we grossly do them. And I see them all over the place in Christendom. All it takes is taking something that you see that's been done that's singular, and now making that a plural. That's a simple, that's where it starts. Pretty soon then you're just, pretty soon then the next person who hears it adds a few things, and then the third person, it's everyone everywhere. Congratulations, you just contributed to slander and sin in a snowball effect that just destroys relationships. Or builds walls and creates sides. And it's sin. It's sin. We, I, it's so sad to hear the commentary here. A few chapters ago, we were in Ephesus, and it was actually the non-believers. So, you know, as Christians, you could be like, oh yeah, see, they get all stirred up about their god Artemis, and they get all upset with Paul. Yeah, here it's, it's like, guess what, guys? A couple chapters later, we don't get out of the debate. We wind up doing the worst thing. They're seeking to kill him. That's why we have to be convicted and be different, because liberal Christian mob... You grieve the Spirit of God. Conservative Christian mob, you grieve the Spirit of God. And the tribune, the one who's actually tasked with reviewing the facts, it's like he could not even learn the facts because of the uproar, right? Man, it's like the book of Acts just defined 2020. Now, most of us, honestly, we're just adding to the noise. And we have to ask that question where do we inflate? Where do we add? And where do we assume in our accusations and our assertions? This could just be re, reposting a meme. I see church, the church doing this, and I, I see our church doing it. And we do talk about it. it. It grieves my heart. Because what happens when we assume? You don't just make a donkey out of you. You're a covenanted member of a church. That means you make a donkey out of your church. And you make a donkey out of Jesus Christ. Guys, not only is this sin, it sullies your church, it profanes Christ. If if we honestly went back, what people do we know we owe an apology for inflation or addition? What celebrities or politicians have we just splattered out there? Do we honestly, and we probably did it publicly, you know, it probably actually would mean it should be a public apology. Public apology for public defamation. If we actually went back and addressed uh, post by post, conversation by conversation, how many additions, assumptions, inflations? We'd probably have a lot of... If we went, if we went decided we were going to do that, we'd probably have work for years. I know I would. And we're, in, we're, just, we're going into an election season. Guys, we have to stop viewing salvation by grace as a license to loose lips. Friends, I, I love you guys. 
But the Bible's not unclear. Jesus isn't unclear. What part of Matthew 12 do we keep continuing to misunderstand when he says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. See, I know, I, I, we all want to do it. We're like, okay, well, I'm not a murderer or a pedophile, and so I know Jesus died for my sins and I won't be condemned, so I'm just going to hit post. Or I'm just going to let, I'm going to let that fly in a conversation. Like, think about this for just a minute. Honestly, I, I think I, there, maybe my brain is wired wrong. You, many of you know this, but I would rather be a murderer sometimes when I think about this. I would rather be a murderer. Think about it. You could take away all of my sins, every one. James was perfect his entire life except for that one time where he added a little bit of slander or inferred or assumed and posted one tweet and a guy had to be executed on a cross for that word. Every careless word. You think all the sins of the world could go away. That one sin brings death. Man, it's, we can't give ourselves the license that somehow it's a lesser thing we don't have to worry about as much. Like, what was your most heinous sin? You're like, okay, I get it. Like, Jesus died for that. How about that one time you misrepresented someone by making their singular thing plural? He died for that. The maligning meme we reposted on Facebook, a man was executed on a cross for that. Jesus died because I like to pop off and blow off some steam sometimes. And we have so many excuses too. Oh, you know, oh, you know what I meant though. Then I should have said that. Say what you mean, don't assume. Every careless word. I was just being sarcastic. I was just being hyperbolic. I got all sorts, I got a whole thesaurus of excuses. No, the Christian doesn't get these slough-offs. I've done all these, by the way. I read, I read those three things. I really think about what those Christians are doing when they get stirred up with Paul, and there's just a slap in the face for all three. Every careless word. Am I an imitator of Christ, or aren't I? Every word that comes out of my lips or my fingertips, right? Can I honestly say Jesus would speak it, that it would come out of His mouth? If not, it shouldn't come out of mine. I don't get to live comfortably in a less than Jesus mode and not worry about it. I mean, scripture says I'm dead to self and Christ lives in me. Oh, what did I just make him say? If Christ would not say it, those exact words, it shouldn't come out of our lips. And that's a tall order. But hey, Paul was called to go and die. I think a fierce bridle on my tongue is not too much to ask. Right? James 3.6 says, The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Like, that's not small. Again, I feel like we just described 2020. Inflate. Add. Exaggerate. Make plural. Ad hominem. Where it is singular. Assert motive. Make sure also you assert motivation when you only know action. Sin, sin, sin. We're just pouring on more agony that Christ endured on that cross. Like I need to hear the shriek of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me and realize that my words are heaping more on that emotional outcry. How does that feel? The Son of God crying out in agony on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he takes his last breath because we, image bearers of God, couldn't keep our mouths shut. <laughs> and it's not just here. It's not that they're, they're not just bashing a non-Christian, right? They're, they're attacking Paul. Now, friends, that's true today. We eat our own. Now, Scripture tells us to do good, especially to the body of believers. It's like we trash talk, especially about our fellow Christians in the press, Right? Oh, it just disgusts me when, let me magnify this thing that's going on in the church somewhere else in the world. It's, it's in vogue. It's like Christian virtue signaling. I'll bash other Christians and let all other non-Christians know, see, we recognize our faults. Funny, though, they're always somebody else's. 
And oftentimes even allegations that haven't been adjudicated and what, what am I doing? I, honestly, we, we need to get back to, we need to cut ourselves off and go back to 1 Thessalonians 4 for a while. This might be our anthem for this month. Aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs. And work with your hands as we instructed you so that may, you may walk properly before outsiders. Now I know some of you immediately you want to jump, well, what about the verses about seeking justice? And, well, that's fine. But maybe some of us have to realize, nope, I'm doing it wrong. I need to start over. It's like, need to reboot the computer. Start over. Start slow. Get this one done. Build on it. It's like, no, you're doing it wrong. Your justice license, your justice seeking license is taken away for a while. Grow in faith in this stuff. We can get back to that. What about contending for the truth? Honestly, some of us just need to realize we can't handle the truth. Literally, handling it poorly, inflating it, adding to it, assuming. Some of us just need to be quiet. Keep our house in order for a while. Start small and building on Scripture. And to be fair, right, this is not opposing all critique or judgment. Even judgment, using wise, discerning, good judgment. We just have to be so careful because there's a difference between adding to the truth and contending for it. My Christians in this chapter are critical and they're judging and they're wrong. But Acts 15 has already happened. We, you can go back and listen to that sermon and it parses out what the deal was between the law and now our freedom in Christ. We talked about that. Paul, Peter, and James, they had a whole council over it. We talked about that in that chapter. There was a time where they came together and contended for the truth and figured it out. Well, there's a difference between adding to Scripture. If I add to Scripture and say, Jesus, to actually to be saved, you need to also do this one thing. Okay, that's, that's wrong. But to contend that following Jesus means we should feel and act this way about a moral issue, that's very worthy of discussion and debate and critique. Romans 12 tells us to test and approve what God's will is. So there is a time to contend. Some of us need to be discerning. Some of us have done a poor job here. And this and this has looked a lot like adding. The question is, are we going to be set apart, guys? That's, that's the big heart that I want. This whole year for me has just even been my own project. How do, I, how do I reset the button and look out at the world differently and then implore my fellow Christians to do the same? We should look different in every critique. We should look different when we don't speak at all. I'm, I'm, I want to believe, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys, I am, I'm fallible. I'm praying urgently that we as a church will be set apart and look different end of the day, you know what? I'm pessimistic. Part of me thinks we're going we're, we're to stand for the things we believe firmly, but we're going to do it by using all the sinful tactics of the world. And my prayer is that God proves me wrong. Because brothers and sisters, we, we don't win by losing. You know, in, in the first century, Israel was under the thumb of Rome. Right? Israel was not in a great place at this time where Paul is. kind of had a puppet king, a kingdom divided and segregated. There was a lot of tension. There was a frustration. There was frustrations about oppression and justice. And then here comes Paul. He's a Jew, but one who had Roman citizenship, doing his level best to bring the truth. And we end this week with him being dragged around, desire to kill him, screaming basically that he's a faith traitor. Why were they so easy to stir up against this one person? Right? They're mad about a lot of similar things that Paul gets accused of. They're, they're mad about a lot of those things. He becomes a convenient target for them. You know what we call that? We call that a scapegoat. They didn't really want the truth or justice. They just wanted to vent their frustration on a scapegoat. And I would go back and personalize the words of Daniel Cameron this morning. Not just say we, but make sure we each ask it of ourselves. Do you really want the truth? Or do you want a truth that fits your narrative? Do you want the facts? 
Are you content to blindly accept your own version of events? We as a church community, honestly, we have to make that kind of decision. We see a large portion of the Jerusalem Christians failing this test utterly. So what of our test? We should echo the good words of Daniel Cameron this last week. He said, in a world that is forcing many of us to pick a side, I choose the side of justice. I choose the side of truth. Friends, we worship a living Savior who is truth and justice and honestly, and our scapegoat. We don't need another one. In Leviticus 16, God has two goats that were used on the Day of Atonement. One would be sacrificed as a blood atonement for the sin of the people. One the priest would pray over and then it would be driven out of the city. Both goats were foreshadowing of Christ's fulfillment. The lamb that was slain for our sins and the scapegoat which our sins are confessed and put on. 2 Corinthians says, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Our sins were laid on Christ. He bore our sins as the scapegoat. We have no more need of making scapegoats, friends. In truth, it's the shame of our collective sin that we need one at all. But praise God we had one so humble and willing as to become the scapegoat so we could be forgiven and have a place undeserved at the Lord's table. Amen? Amen. So I, today, I, I really want today for us to be a real day of repentance as a church. Not abstract, not general confession, though obviously as we have unique or individual sins to unburden ourselves at as we come to the table in a moment of silence, obviously confess those sins to God. But I would ask us to consider these Scriptures in closing. From Matthew 15, what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them. Jesus says, but what comes out of their mouth, that's what defiles them. James 2 says, no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Psalm 141 then gives us the answer when the psalmist cries out, set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. That's what we need to pray this morning. Proverbs 15 tells us, the heart of the righteous weighs its answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. Proverbs 10 says, sin is not attended, sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the prudent hold their tongues. Proverbs 17 says, the one who has knowledge uses words, uses words with restraint, and whoever has understanding is even-tempered. First Peter 3 then says, whoever would lose life and see good days, oh sorry, whoever would love life, <laughs> that's a little different, whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. You know, in Job, Job talks about how he made a covenant with his eyes not to look lustfully at a woman. I, I would ask us as a church today in our hearts to make a covenant with our tongues, to ask God for that guard to repent of the many ways we've abused that. The world has allowed us and champions a verbal license we are not called to mirror. And I hope from September 2020, from this day forward, I hope my words will be markedly different. Christ died for all those ill-uttered things that I have set up to this day. And I commit today to striving by the Holy Spirit in the name of the risen Jesus Christ to let Him teach me the more excellent way. I would invite you into that today as we prepare for communion together. Let's pray. Father, help me to use my words. I know our words, God, are just the beginning. You have so many encouragements and admonishments for our actions that follow. And so God, I ask that you would help all of us in a sense to appeal to you to walk us through what it looks like to hit the reset button in a time when, God, I fear the end of this year and the fractures in relationship, the devastation to families, the incendiary verbal bombs hurled as this year comes to a close. 
God, I know many of us may need to walk through some of it. Some of us may have our time going to Jerusalem before us. But God, as the heart of a pastor, I, I would ask that at least we in our community right here would set a bar to be different with one another and to weather it together. Not just for community, but because we represent You with every single word. And I believe by the power of Your Holy Spirit, You could make no careless ones come out of these mouths. I know You invite us into that struggle to even, as our Belgic Confession said, to crucify the flesh and its desires. To put to death the sin that is in us. And while it does sometimes seem like a struggle, God, don't let us look past our words to the actions that we are seeking to put to death in our life. But let's make sure we look at the words. Help us in that. And give us no excuses. God, do not let us join the Christian mobs that may be ranting and shrieking in our culture around us. Teach us how to use our words with restraint and with prudence, and then how to contend boldly, like Paul for the faith, which we will see him do with great eloquence and great love and affection for you. Give us the humility we need as we come to the Lord's table and then that peace that passes understanding that we do have salvation. And while we seek for this guard, it is not to ensure our salvation. That we restrain our tongues, it is not for fear of you changing your mind about what Jesus has done. But we rest in His completed work and do it for the sake of our love and devotion to you and your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.